what's up? John Sonmez from simpleprogrammer.com. Oh, knocking things over. I got a question here about architects and agile and scrum environments. I thought I'd, I'd answer this one real quick here. And this one, I'm not gonna use a name here, but this gentleman, my phone just likes to beep my watch. Uh, he says, uh, I have been following you for a long time and watch almost every post and video of yours that really is helping a lot of people. Always wanted to listen to your perspective about an issue that I dealt with in the past. I wanted, I worked in an organization where the architects don't code and they always contribute in trivial things. Actually work is done by the development team. The so-called architects market themselves very well with management and are non-technical in nature and the manager doesn't seem to understand the real issue at all and they always side with the architects. My question, how do you think the development team needs to handle or tackle this situation? So this is interesting. So there's there's a couple of different, I've got a couple of perspectives on this. So I've actually been in, in the role of this kind of an architect before, sort of, where I've been in charge of helping a team to deliver functionality and to do a good job of it. And I haven't, I want to write code. <laughs> I've tried to write code. I've, you know, it's been actually wrong of me to write code when I should be doing other things. So, so I've been limited in the, the code that, that I could write in that case. And that's kind of frustrating, right? So I've been on that side of it. And, and the reason why I'm starting there is because it's also possible that, you know, that some of the architects that are working in that organization, that they, they would love to write code. They'd love to get more involved. They're working on trivial things simply because that's what they can actually devote their time to and actually get done, right? You know, one, one of the struggles I had in my career that I faced a, a lot was that as I became better as a software developer, often more and more of my time would be spent in mentoring and architecting roles rather than actually writing code. But I wanted to write code, right? This was one of the recurring themes of my software development career as I, as I started to progress was, I just want to write code. <laughs> even now, even when I started Simple Programmer, I mean, now I don't even get to write any code. So sad, but th that's, that's something that, that happens to a lot of architects. So it's really easy to say, well, these guys, you know, they're not actually writing the code. You know, they contribute in, in trivial things. You know, they're they're kind of snowing management who's non-technical and management always sides with them and not understand their perspective. And and I'm, I'm coming at it from that angle first because I, I want you to understand that that's, that's, it may not be the case here. It may be that these architects are incompetent and that they are really just, you know, gaming the system and they don't really know what they're doing and they're very high paid consultants or, <laughs> or something like that. But it may also be that they, they're they just, there's only so much time. There's only so much that a person can do. And as you start to develop and grow in your career, you get to a point where you, you'd like to write code, but you, ju you just can't. You just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't scale. So you, you're actually, maybe you can pick up a, a couple of trivial things, right? I, I've worked on, on larger teams where I've worked on some of the large architecture of, of very big projects, and there's no way, there's just no way I'm writing code, right? I'm, I'm going to all these meetings. I'm meeting with engineers that are working on the electrical engineers that are working on the actual boards and circuit design and I'm working working with project managers on the schedule we're talking about the architecture discussing you know I'm prototyping new ideas new ways to use the operating system and what what do we have to do to interface with the different drivers and how can we can I get a web application or a you know a web server built into the machine you know there's a lot of stuff that they might be doing that I was doing at least and so so I'm, I again I don't want to just take the side of the architect here, but but I want you to understand that that, that that's possible. There's a lot of stuff. It, it, you you won't realize it until you get there, and it just seems like I understand from the developer's perspective, it could be like, oh, these guys, they they just talk, they just blah blah blah. They think they know it all, and they they're talking to management, and, and management always believes them, and management doesn't understand the real struggle. The the the, the struggle is real, <laughs> as we're fighting here on the development team. And so now I'm going to take the other piece of this, right? So. I, as a developer, 
you can be seeing this and, and, and you can see it from that perspective and you can be right as well, right? I mean, no, no one's gonna be, this is a very delicate balance and it's not gonna be perfect, right? There's so many things that you as a developer see and you know what's going on and you understand the code base and you understand what's happening and these architects, these ivory tower architects, they don't understand, they don't get what's going on. They're like designing the system, but you're the one who's building the system. You're the one who's actually doing the real design. You know, they have these ideas and they're not grounded to what's actually happening on the project and they don't understand the code base. They don't understand this stuff. So they're making decisions in a vacuum. As a development team, as a developer, what can you do to tackle this situation? Well. The best thing that you can do is to not develop a combative sort of environment with the architects, right? Instead, what you want to do is you want to say, look, how can we make your job easier, right? You got to, if you understand what I talked about at the first part of this, of this video, then you might be able to figure out, okay, well, what would make their jobs easier would be to give them this information, to give them, instead of in a combative, combative way, a lot of times there's this, you know, developer architect and this kind of thing where developers are being passive aggressive and the architects are, you know, whatever, they're, they're being all high and mighty, like they're trying to establish their authority and, and it becomes this, this whole thing because where developers are trying to prove the architect wrong. Instead, if you're giving information, if you're like, okay, look, as a development team, our job, what we need to do in order to assist the architects on this project as much as possible is to give them as much information as possible. It's to say, hey, hey, could you come over here? I want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly to get them into the code base a little bit to, you know, to realize that you're in there working on the code all day, right? And they're working on maybe some other things, especially if this is a very huge project, they might be working on some of the things I described with figuring out if you can put a web server into this embedded operating system and what are the patches that we need to install and is the bus going to be large enough to support all the data that we're going to pass through and, you know, all of these different components. And so they're not actually in the code base. And it's not because they're incompetent necessarily, right? I mean, they might be, but don't assume that. Instead, say, okay, how can I get information that I'm going to get to this, to this team so that they can make the right decisions or so that they can trust me to make those decisions, right? You can almost lay it out and you can say, look, look, here's the thing. Here's what we're proposing as a developer team. I know that you don't have time to like dig into the, the depth of the code. I know you're working on important things and, and you've got a design and I don't want to ruin your day. I don't want to say that the design that you have isn't going to work, but I want to, I want to be honest with you and give you some information that I think that you need to make a better decision because I know that it's hard for you to get that information. You're not looking at the code base. You're not seeing the changes. You're not seeing what we're seeing as a development team. Here's what I did. I compiled a list of all the stuff that we're working on. I compiled a list of, of the, the way that we could implement the architecture that you designed. And there's three ways you know, and you look at them and you tell me what, what, how you want us to proceed, what, what makes sense. We're, we're kind of in a situation where I'm not really liking any of these ways, but maybe you have a better idea or maybe we're misunderstanding something, right? If you're giving that information and you're approaching that way, that's going to be best in that case, because it's going to be non-competitive. Again, it's not, it's going to be hard because sometimes you're going to be in situations where the architect is really incompetent and really doesn't know what he's doing. But that's, that's tactic is still going to work because if he is competent and he is working on building the system and he just doesn't have time to look at the code and he just doesn't have, have the, the ability to be in the code like you are, then giving him that information and being an, an ally and helping him to be able to do his job by providing them the information is going to go a long way. But if he's incompetent and you're doing that, it's still going to go a long way because now you're going to cover up for his incompetence and he's just going to, he's basically going to defer to you. Right? You're either going to have a situation where this person is going to be competent and they're going to trust you and they're going to like give you more of the control and autonomy to make decisions because they understand that you understand what's going on and you're not fighting them, or they're going to be one of those incompetent people that rose to the, to the top via the Peter principle. And then, and then they're going to say, Whoa, haha, this guy makes me look good. I like this guy. I'm just going to do what he, what he tells me to do. And then I'll pretend like I came up with it and it was my idea and I will make the mandate from on high. 
it requires some pride swallowing to do that. But the real people who are on the team and on the project will know where the ideas are coming from, that they're really coming from the dev team. So you got to make those kind of decisions. I know it's not easy. It, it, it's tough. But, you know, th there's a certain thing about command and control. There's a certain thing about, you know, the, the hierarchies. And you're just not going to when, when you're when you're in a lower position in a hierarchy, your only option is to influence. Right. And and even when you're in a higher position, it's to info like you can pull the authority card once or twice. Right. But every time you pull the authority card, you weaken the authority card. It's only to it's it's break glass in case of emergency type of thing. Right. Bullets are whizzing over your head. OK, I'm going to tell you what to do and you're going to listen and we're not going to you're not going to question it because we need to get this shit done now. Right. So, but when you, especially when you're in a lower position in a hierarchy, you have to, you have to influence, you have to be that positive, you have to report information up and, and you influence and by being competent, by being non-combative, by, by respecting that level of authority, that gives you that influence with that person who has the authority and hopefully they give it back to you to make the they defer it back to you to make those decisions so maybe not what you wanted to hear and I can't judge whether an architect is a good one or a bad one like I said I can just tell you that there are some reasons why this can happen having been been in this position where the architect isn't involved in the code and it's not because he's incompetent it's just because there's a lot of stuff to do that that you might not realize you know it, it's just a misunderstanding type of thing in, in many cases but I've also been in places I've been on the development team like you said but you still got to deal with them. You still got to figure it out. You got to still figure out how are you going to salvage this situation. And if it's too much incompetence and you've got no influence, you've got no control of it, maybe you need to get out of the situation. And that's the only thing that you can do. But whatever you do, never ever, right? You have to understand the game of power. I think I think I did a video, if we can find the video, about dealing with power and understanding power. But you have to understand the game of power and you have to realize that when you don't have power, you do not fight. It, you you're going to lose don't fight battles that you are going to lose it's just frustrating and it's it's just going to be a thing that's going to hurt your career it's, it's not going to help you so you got to realize those situations and then if you can you can influence from there but do not directly fight someone who has more power than you it's just it's just silly i hope that helps <laughs> if you like this video click that subscribe button below and if you need to share this with an architect friend of yours that that could could use this <laughs> go ahead he might, he might even appreciate it so uh you know you never know all right i'll talk to you next time take care